the legendary. She is here, of course, uh, out there in them streets talking about the things that need to be talked about over chuckles. Let me welcome the great Marsha Warfield. Hello, the great Karen Hi. Hunter. Ah. <laughs> Yes, the greatness is all in the room. Omi Bell is here as well. We magnify one another. We just are a reflection of the the things and the spirits that we operate in. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Listen, um, first, let me get some uh, business out the way, some business. There is a reboot of Night Court, which I'm not watching because you ain't in it. So I'm just going to just be honest about it. I, I'm like, uh, what the hell? She's still funny here all the like y'all y'all don't want no ratings so before i go in did they invite you no uh, no uh and i think they wanted to go there are a couple of things they wanted to go in a whole different direction and two you know uh when i took over there were two bailiffs before me who passed away and they were both younger then than i am now so if you have to, you know, kind of hedge your bets, you might want to go with somebody who is about the same age I was when I started Night Court. But that would have been the comedy for you to still be the bailiff or or <laughs> maybe you see what I'm saying? Like that that shows they have no creativity because I would have either brought you back as a judge. You know, maybe you went to law school afterwards and you'd be in a other, not maybe every day. You ain't got to be in every week. But like just to uh, to me, I feel like we we cut off the lineage and the legacy when you're still here. They could have brought you in with some creative way. You're a judge now or something like or still a bailiff, which would have been hilarious, like on some other level. But, yeah, I just feel like they they they're so lazy. Well, you never know, you know, but I, I just wish them well. And, uh, you know, there are other opportunities to uh, to exploit and things to try to get into so if it happens great if it don't you know life will go on i will keep on doing what i do okay so you you're out there performing apparently doing stand-up all over so uh, let me get that out of the way too where where's your next place that you're gonna be i'll be at the westgate at a club called the comedy cabaret they're opening it's their opening weekend I'll be there from the 9th to the 11th at 10 o'clock. So with uh, Kathleen Dunbar and Kirk uh, McHenry. I don't know him, but I look forward to meeting him. And I think it's going to be a great show. All right. So where, where, where's the Westgate? Where's that? This is Los it's Angeles? Vegas. Where? It's here, Vegas. Here Vegas. Las yeah. Vegas. Okay. All right. So y'all in Vegas or in LA near Vegas can drive there. Uh, the 9th and the 11th, that's Thursday through uh, Sunday to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, Thursday through Saturday, 10 p.m. You can see Marsha Warfield. And then are you just doing Vegas dates? I have a couple of other things coming up. We are not ready to talk about it, but we're, okay. we're working right. on stuff right now. OK, now I also see you in 9-11. Well, I used to. I didn't check this season yet because uh, I got a lot of other things that I'm watching right now. But 9-9-1-1. No, is it 9 Yes, 9 one one You play Henrietta's mama. We've mm-hmm. talked to you about that. Uh, are you there? Because it, it seemed like they were trying to phase her. I was like, what y'all doing with Aisha? Hold on now. Wait, are y'all trying to make me not ever watch this again. Well, what is happening? I don't know. You know, I'm available if they want to have me. And, uh, you know, if not, like I said, there are so many other things that are possible and doable. There's the Marsha verse that has a lot of different directions to uh, explore and exploit. So. I'm uh, like I said, I love working the show. Uh, Angela Bassett, uh, Aisha Hines, Tracy Toms, what's not to love? Um, but like I said, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I ain't gonna quit. Okay. You are so super zen. It's like I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> like I have a question about comedy, but I'm also like you, your whole energy is just so like, you know what? If I'm doing it, if I'm doing it, if I'm not, if I'm not, how did you, were you always this way or did you over time get here? Uh, were you ever kind of like hustle anxious? I got to get it. I got to get it. Um, was there something that clicked for you? Like, I'm curious about your journey. Well, I don't know. I think I've always been kind of uh, laid back. You know, my mother called it lazy, uh, but <laughs> basically 
I just like to go with the flow. I think we we uh, we we work too much. I mean, I think we vibe too high. I was watching Harriet in the movies, uh, you know, the Harriet Tubman story. And toward the end, I noticed that my my energy was here in like fight or flight mode. I was right up here and uh, vibrating way too high. And I realized I do this a lot. I mean, I'm always on high alert, always tense, always What's next? Where are we going? And it bothered me. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm not going to really do that. Or I'm going to try not to do that anymore. And just take things as they come and, and deal with them uh, as they need to be dealt with. Oh, on that. So you're, you're, you're doing a lot of leaning in because this country uh, wants to forget that there was a 400 year period of enslavement and annihilation of indigenous people and robber barons and capitalism. We don't want to talk about any of that. We just want to talk about exceptionalism and patriotism. But it, we, we got here through some very uh, interesting means. And I think, you know, the, the education from Arkansas to Florida to Texas to Louisiana, they want to erase books and people from history. Uh, so that keeps us at, at this kind of fever pitch of fight. We got to fight, right? right? So how do you fight in the Zen mode? Well, you know, that's really the only way to fight because they're coming at us with emotion and they're coming at their supporters with emotion. They want you to be emotional and irrational. And the only way to counter it is to just like we do, do the things we've been accused of doing that are supposed to be negative. I talk about the sapphire spirit, that spirit that was labeled the angry black woman is a negative, she's not feminine, she's not whatever, but it's just the attitude that you can't tell me that. You mm. simply can't tell me that I will not listen. And it's been a constant. And I think if we embrace that spirit, that spirit, of, you can't tell me that, that often manifests itself as, or, you know, or it intimidates people because they're, they're at such a, a fever pitch, they want you to match it so they can defeat that. Well, you can't defeat stuff, you can't tell me that, you can't tell me so. Mm, mm. You know, it's interesting you bring up Sapphire. I remember um, I did a book called Children of Children Keep Coming with a man named Russell Goings, one of the first Black men to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. And he convened a room full of young uh, investment bankers. They were just integrating the whole banking space. Uh, so he had um, among them at, uh, as well as Clarence and a few Clarence Smith in a room together to start a magazine for Black women, which I find interesting. There was a room full of men just determining uh, what would happen with black women that black women needed a magazine. So we're, let's convene a bunch of men to talk about it. The All initial right. name was going to be uh, essence was going to be called Sapphire. And they came to the conclusion that that was too radical. Uh, and it also delivered a sort of message that they did. So it came essence was what they landed on. And I think about that, you know, uh, what you're, what you're saying right now, that energy that we've allowed it to be erased, much like our spirituality and religion and all these other things, because uh, and we've allowed ourselves to be labeled, which is why I'm not going to let anybody call my name in a pejorative, never on this show, never right. in my in my space, because my name is power. So what you're not going to do, you know, is allow for uh, entertainers to to degrade, you know, something that my parents came up with uh, that they loved in me. So I just you know, I, I, I like that is reclaiming our time is what that sounds like. Well, in a way, but I think here again, um, Sapphire comes out of minstrelsy and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's indirect because uh, she really was born uh, on the Amos and Andy show that when she was labeled, she was always part of the negative black woman stereotype, but she became Sapphire on Amos and Andy. So she's a TV, she's a modern stereotype. And um, we have to realize that all movies and TV, everybody in the movie is a stereotype. We focus on the negative stereotypes, but the white man hero trope is a stereotype. It is something that is just as not true, just as uh, made up, but it always puts 
the hero as a white man. And it always puts the non-feminine, <laughs> sassy black woman as a black woman. But that spirit has, I believe, been a constant throughout history. It's just been depicted as a yasa boss, no boss, or go take a flying leap. I believe the spirit of, of Sapphire existed on plantations and that yes, no, sir, was yes, sir. no, sir. I'm not going to submit. I will do what I have to do to survive. But you can't tell me that. <laughs> you cannot make me serve you the way you want to be served. And I believe that we, because we don't see that reflected in the media, we believe that there were happy slaves running around uh, caring more about the people they served than they did about the people they were losing to sales mm. and death and disease. So, you know, we just have to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of our ancestors and go, now, would you have been walking around talking about, sir, yes, sir, I want to know how good you is. How you doing today? Or would you have done just what you had to do to survive? And when you think about that, when you put yourself in those shoes, those pejoratives become strengths. Com that's why they mock you, because it is something that, that uh, takes you out of per the perpetual servant class and into equality. I love that so much. You know what, Karen, today's show may be about spirit and ancestors because I feel like that just came right on in. <laughs> I love that. I So I'm curious, you know, comedy is one of those things that has been a sort of way of keeping an oral uh, tradition, that griot spirit just going. Um, and we've been able to sort of make fun of and storytell at the same time, right? Because even the, the, the comedy is the truth of somebody. Um, what they're experiencing. I'm curious as to what you think about it now um, in terms of like, now there's so many touchy subjects. Now, like uh, those truths are being challenged um, in multiple ways, whether it is gender specific or like gender norms or sexuality or uh, relationships between people's trauma. Now people are looking at comedy a whole lot different than they used to. And I wonder what you think about that. What is your take on it and any experiences that you may have had where you've had to adjust? Well, comedy has always been a tool and, and some people get to use it uh, far more than others. Uh, the whole blackface uh, minstrelsy uh, uh, industry was made to mock black people. That's what it was all about. And so... It is the basis of modern American show business. And without challenge, it will continue to mock black people until we start looking at it as that was a tool, that was a, 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 a propaganda arm of white supremacy. That undergirded the attitudes that people had that allowed them to continue to be abusive and exploitive and oppressive and, and racist. Once you set these, these uh, images in stone, that's what you think of, of these people. You think, again, of your brain doesn't really, you know, uh, separate real from false. It just takes in information. And so you get this information and all your life you're told that the cowboys and the Western and the guy that saves you and here he comes da, 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 da. and he's usually the guy who kills the most people for the mm -hmm. best reasons whereas the black people who don't do nothing to nobody are, show, are seem to be shown to be villains and all that kind of stuff and so comedy for black people has always been a weapon too but it's usually been on a more individual scale you had comedians who made tremendous statements that we don't even we're not even aware of. There was a time when, let's say, Nipsey Russell, we all know who Nipsey Russell, he was a comedian who made a transition from minstrelsy or burlesque to television. And he started as a baggy pants kind of comedian. In the, 50, in the 60s and early 60s, comedians like 
Timmy Rogers and Red Fox and and uh, uh, Dick Gregory started wearing suits, business suits. Started talk uh, talking about uh, politics and and more serious subjects and challenged the the status quo that said black people are not intelligent enough to trick white people into laughter. And if you are, that is a bad thing because it goes against everything that we've been taught. And so just the act of wearing a suit and a mustache was radical. There have mm. been many radical uh, comedians that we don't really give the, uh, we don't look at them that way because we're not encouraged to. But oh. Richard Pryor, broke a lot of uh, rules and laws just by speaking in our language. And before that, everybody had to code switch. If you're going to be on TV, you have to speak articulately. Mm -hmm. Richard said, no, I'm going to speak the way I speak. You understand me. <laughs> you know what That's I'm right. talking about. That is and right. it changed the entire game. Uh, and I said, like Dick Gregory, those people have challenged uh, uh, racist stereotypes in ways that we don't really acknowledge, and they need to be uh, given a lot of uh, credit for that.